Art Loft is brought to you by Where there is freedom, there is expression. The Florida Keys and Key West. The Miami-Dade County Tourist Development Council, the Miami-Dade County Department of Cultural Affairs, and the Cultural Affairs Council, the Miami-Dade County Mayor, and the Board of County Commissioners, and by the Friends of South Florida PBS. Hi, I'm Jumani Anamdi. And I'm Lola Reskin. And from the Rain Barrel Artisan Village in front of Betsy here in Isla Mirada. This, this right here, this is Art Law. Now take a ride with us as we take a tour down the Florida Keys. You ready, Lolo? Let's go. All right. So we're starting our Keys trip today up at the top of the Keys here at Key Largo Yoga. And I'm here with Daisy of Florida Keys Belly Dance. Tell me a little bit about uh, the art of belly dance in general and, and when, how you got started. I got started in about 2005 with the Shakira craze. Okay. <laughs> I am actually a belly dancer originally. Mm -hmm. And I started incorporating fire into my belly dance. Mm -hmm. Belly dance is actually, in every language, is referred to the belly because there is a lot of uh, muscle uh, control with belly dance. And I came to the Keys and there was, the, there were classes in the Keys, but they weren't really being promoted. I decided to ask them to please give me their information so that people can easily find these things when they start living in the Florida Keys. We are a strand of island and pretty much every island has belly dance class. Oh, great. That they can attend. So my latest workshop, Awaken the Snake Goddess, has been inspired by my pythons, my ball pythons. I own five of them that I have adopted, and they perform with me. Jax is about 14, 15 years old. I've had him for about a year now. I believe we're going to do a little mini workshop today. So the first thing that we're going to do is snake styling, as I call it. And you're going to push your hip to the forward angle and that one um, is going to be up here like a plate like you're holding a plate and then you're going to bring it to you with your fingers closed see how that looks like a snake's head mm -hmm. and then come in the back of the neck up look at the camera and over we're going to practice first the walk because originally this is called the camel walk mm -hmm. okay, so here cross Bring out that foot, cross that foot and forward, bring out the right foot. So that is our cat walk. Okay. The challenging part, here we go, the challenging part is going to be the abdominals. So you want to be in a seated, um, relaxed position. Mm -hmm. We always want to have our back safe. Um, we're going to work on the tuck, okay. which is in with the pelvis, in. And it's kind of like if somebody is punching you in the stomach. Yeah, that. Mm -hmm. You get that? Yeah. Tuck, walk. Tuck, walk. Tuck, walk. Thank you so much for that awesome workout. And where can people who want to find out more about your workshops and performances learn more about what you're doing down here? You can visit FloridaKeysBellyDance.info. So we're in Isla Mirada, and I have found my way into a treasure trove full of books. I'm here with Kathy Keller, who is the owner of Hooked on Books. One of the cool things about your bookstore here in the Keys, it's one of three independent bookstores, and you guys have a great selection of books about Florida and by Florida authors. That developed slowly. We started out with two books, Land Remembered and Charlotte's Story. We saw there was such an interest in Florida history and Keys history, and it's grown and grown. <laughs> We are really tourist driven and so many of them come back year after year and they come in and they say they're so happy you're still here. From words on a page, we're about to go to Little Haiti where some artists incorporate poetry into their paintings. Let's go take a look. I'm here in Little Haiti on this really quiet street on the 
beautiful day. And I came here to introduce you all to these two artists I met, Alan Joseph and Trey Thompson. Now, Alan paints the pictures, and Trey, he expresses the works through poetry. We're gonna meet him today so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Hey, Alan, how you doing, buddy? All right, hey, Trey. Hey, Jumani. I see you still working. Every time I come here, I'm just so impressed by everything I see. Well, you paint the pieces, oh, yeah. and then you express with the pieces their meaning through poetry. Through poetry, wow. The Infinity Inspiration has been our, uh, our birth child. Okay. It was the first collection that we worked on. It's 100 paintings with 100 poems that express each artwork, and each painting in each poem in the collection becomes an actual book. You just got your book published, right? So that's with this series. How did you start Infinity Artworks and Poetry? We met each other at a corner store buying a cold beer on a hot day. Wait a minute, I met you guys at a corner store <laughs> exactly. buying a cold beer on a hot day. That's crazy. Exactly. <laughs> Alan's an artist in its purest form in regards to painting, sculptures, and as I was cutting his hair, he received a haircut, he was like, hey, I got a feeling that you do more than just barber and cut hair. He said, what else is it that you do? And I told him that I'm a writer. I like to collaborate with other people and bring them in to what I do. I wrote 10 poems to 10 paintings, and he's like, I've been looking for you for the past five years. I've been to Paris, I've been to Haiti, and I'm here in the U.S., and this is where I find you. Wow. I have to tell our viewers here, when I first met Trey and Alan, you know, they said, come check out my studio. So I finally got here, and I saw a piece that really spoke to me when I was here. And you told me, hey, you cannot have the piece yet. I have to write a poem for the piece. The best thing about this poem is that I saved the last line to actually create in person, live. Oh, wow. Uh, the actual poem is based on your daughter's name. Her name is Nataki. Notice me, my birth is high. Above the truth, I never lie. There is nothing you can do to earn God's grace. Almighty God gives, Almighty God takes. Kill my body, give birth to my soul. Here's the last line. In immortality, our blood will hold. I think you don't understand why that's so dope. And his sister. Nataki passed away at 18 months. So we named after her in that poem. That's dope. Her I, blood holds song. And yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Well, thank you. You're more than welcome, brother. I was not expecting this. All right. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You got it. That's dope. We're headed to Key West. However, I heard in Marathon, this is really awesome guy who does some amazing wood carvings out of natural wood. So let's check it out if we see it. He's supposed to be on the side of the road somewhere around here. I think I see him up here. Wow, so this is Mike's off the chain carvings. Mike is really doing amazing works from this natural material. I mean, he's taking this wood from stump to stellar. Now, there's another artist that's doing amazing pieces with natural material. The piece is called Sand Amphitheater, and it was produced by Art Center South Florida. Let's check that out. The conversations we had initially between myself, Art Center, and the City of Miami Beach were very simple. I was tasked with engaging with the City of Miami Beach to better understand how they're tackling sea level rise and process that into my work in order to create public programs of some kind. I was given a, a bit of free reign in regards to how that would be presented. Sand is the foundation for Miami Beach, and sand 
as this metaphor for a artwork um, was kind of too easy to, to let go. This is kind of a fun new project for Art Center. We've invited an artist at the beginning of his career, really, to come to Miami Beach, spend a full year with us, and dig in on the issue of climate change. One of the really cool things about this opportunity is we've been able to get Misael Soto embedded in city government. He shows up there regularly, he attends meetings, he's in the decision-making moments when we talk about sea level rise and climate change in our community. Miss Ayel's been here for a number of months now. He is out there working every day with people. And then of course, the sand project is his way of really bringing all that together. It uses approximately 176 cubic yards of sand. Once I settled on sand, I needed a container. And so sandbags was the obvious choice. Sandbags being this temporary object that we rely on during emergencies and knowing that the city had many of them available to hand out to residents and business owners when there's flooding. Uh, we are very excited because it's a new way to engage the community around climate change, environmental issues, um, be a new voice for how we're uh, communicating everything that the city is doing, as well as giving a fresh perspective on the challenges that we have, as well as what the solutions look like. Uh, so it's great to have somebody in the room with a creative background that's really outside of the normal government everyday operations. At the time, I was reading a lot about basic spaces that provided an opportunity for everyone to kind of state how they were feeling about something or have a dialogue about something. That led me to this kind of Greek and then Roman uh, structure of a amphitheater or a theater or an arena, those being spaces where this would happen back then. surprise that I went through in the first week was just how hard the work was, the, the sheer kind of labor of it. The bags weigh up, upwards of 50, 60 pounds. You're dropping down and picking each one individually. Your fingers, your hands are, are constantly kind of stretched. After the first week, I'd wake up and I, I wouldn't be able to close my hands in the morning. They would just kind of be like swollen open. It was a lot of work. I underestimated that for myself and then I underestimated that for the volunteering. Whoever showed up, you soon realized that you had to surrender to labor. It was hard. You got tired. But you realized that it was gonna take the weeks that Miss L had scheduled into this project. I don't know how I got up <laughs> every day. I mean, I just, I had a responsibility that I had been given from Art Center in the city to kind of do this work. Somehow creating a, a public forum or a public uh, a form of engagement for the community. We've been building this in public, and as it's been built, we've been using the structure as an amphitheater, and then a theater, and then an arena to sit on and to host lectures, performances, discussions, all around the topic of sand. From our tribe, from our community, we appreciate what you're doing here. We appreciate the fact that you're acknowledging indigenous people into your uh, ceremonies and events and allowing us to speak and to be part of what's happening. This country has to learn to be a community before we move forward. I've been asked to talk about a, a, sort of an historical overview of the beach. It's such a fascinating story and a lot of you are familiar with bits and pieces and maybe even more than that of the story, but I'm, I'm glad to share it with you especially in this setting here. I just think it's uh, so unique. We were the house band, so we were there for every single iteration. Um, we'd perform a couple live songs, and then we'd do sort of mood music. And I ended up changing the lyrics to certain songs to make them about sand, and then I was playing with the sand and having these sort of poetic, unexpected moments. Part of it that has surprised me the most is the exchange that's created in our community. We're a community of a lot of tourists, 
but also we have 85,000 people on Miami Beach. And it's really begun to create some dialogue. And I think that's important for the issues that we're facing. I wouldn't go back and change a single thing. You know, to me, the structure was exactly as large as it needed to be because it was in direct correlation to how much work, how much hours myself and those who wanted to help could help and were willing to help. The amount of time that it's been finished, which has been three days, to the amount of time it took us to get to it being finished, which has been an entire month, in that side, it's like, oh, okay, so the piece is actually building it and it's not the final structure. It's a little sad. <laughs> I'm sad, but in a good way. All right, here we go. It definitely came out of what I see as a necessity to create space for, for discourse. All of these bags will be emptied, and the sand will go back at North Shore Park in, in North Beach. I gotta go. It's key lime pot time. Hey. Next up, Big Pine Key in the Artists in Paradise Gallery. I'll introduce you to Dale Malone, who is a watercolor painter. I love to paint my favorite things and things that are just beautiful to me. And I'm not very good at people. <laughs> I like bright colors. I'm not really a very pastel y watercolor artist. <laughs> I couldn't wait till black and white TV and stuff back when I was young came out in color. Another great place to find historic pieces of watercolor is at the Norton Museum of Art in West Palm Beach. We take you on a tour of Ralph Norton's watercolor pieces. My name is Ellen Roberts and my position is Harold and Ann Berkeley Smith Curator of American Art. And this is my exhibition, Modern Spontaneity. Ralph Norton's watercolor collection. So it's about our founder and his great collection of watercolors. I've just done a book on him. The one thing that I found in doing the research for it was that he was a great collector of watercolor. You can really then see this developing, the kind of trajectory of his collecting and how he gets more and more avant-garde. He appreciated watercolor. He had a special appreciation for the medium. Also, it's, it was uh, less expensive than oil painting, so I think often it was a kind of a conservative way to move into a new artist because it was a less expensive investment. Because watercolors are so light sensitive, we have been showing them on a kind of rotating basis. We never show them all at once. So this is really a unique opportunity to appreciate that because they can only be up for three months and then we have to put them away for five years. So see them now or otherwise you have to come back later. The different colors fade at different rates, so uh, reds do tend to be very fugitive. I would not say that I'm going to be more careful with this one than the other ones because we just need to be careful with all of them. But it's great that we have such great vivid color left in this one and it just shows what great shape it's in. We don't often mix American and European art here, but it's exciting to do so, I think, because these are all modern artists. In the early 20th century, many American and European artists knew each other, and they were going back and forth across the ocean, so that kind of division between American and European is kind of artificial. I like that title because I think that modern artists were attracted to watercolor uh, for several reasons, but one reason was because it seemed very spontaneous. You can often see the artist's brush stroke on the paper, but that being said, it's in fact very hard to manipulate watercolor. You can't erase it, you can't cover it up because it is transparent, so in fact you have to be a real master of it, and it's in fact not that spontaneous because of that. So it's kind of a, a paradox, I guess, of the of medium in that sense. They also liked watercolor modern artists because it does call attention to the artist's hand and that's something they were very interested in doing, kind of calling attention to the fact that the work is a work of art and not a window on the world. So this is George Gross's Eaten and To Be Eaten, it's called. It's fascinating to me that Ralph Norton bought this. He bought this in 1939 and 
it is, that's very early for him to buy something that's this kind of surrealist where there's really no realistic sense of space here. And in fact, one thing that Ralph Norton would often do is that when he bought a work, he would then write to the artist just asking for more information about the work. So he did write to, to George Gross about this work. And George Gross said, I find it very unusual that you would have bought this because it has a kind of pessimistic sense to it, and that's very unusual for an American collector of this time, and it really is unusual. So this is kind of the most, one of the most out there things that Ralph Norton bought. We're in Key West, we finally made it. We're so excited. I'm here with Sarah Thomas, and she is the founder of the Old Town Literary Walking Tours. How did you start it? My grandparents had a house down here since before I was born. And so I would always had the sort of fantasy of moving down here as a writer. You know, I'd read Ernest Hemingway and then Tennessee Williams and Elizabeth Bishop. And so finally, I just, you know, quit the job, moved to Key West and started researching. Then we got it going and the seminar acquired it and now it's just kind of taken on a life as its own. Yeah. So we get to get a tour from the founder. Yeah. So this is very special. It is very special. All right. Well, we're ready. You guys ready? Let's hop on together. We always start at the Monroe County Public Library. It's actually the first public library in the state of Florida. It's home to the books of so many writers that have lived down here. Twelve Pulitzer Prize winners have called it home. That's more per capita than any town in the United States. And to kind of speak to, I think, our most famous writer, the Key West Library actually has a really special place in his story, too. Agnes von Kurowski, who I think is even more interesting. She was a librarian, and she was the inspiration for the character of Catherine in Ernest Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms, which was one of his most famous works. And she's sort of the tragic heroine, the nurse that's featured in it that, spoiler alert, dies at the end. But that was based on this actual woman who was a nurse that nursed young Hemingway back to health during World War I when he was an ambulance driver. And weirdly, years later, their paths converge, and she was a librarian here when he and Pauline, his second wife, lived here. So our first stop's down on Williams Street. It's Shel Silverstein's old place, uh, the poet and children's book writer that lived here in the 80s and 90s. It's this really cool wood cottage where he did most of his writing, most of his business correspondences, and so forth. He did finish A Light in the Attic down here and certainly wrote a number of other poems, songs, and he was a pretty prolific songwriter. Most people don't know, he wrote Boy Named Sue for Johnny Cash. He won a Grammy for it. He didn't own a house here when he published Where the Sidewalk Ends, but the writing in that poem, there is a place where the sidewalk ends and before the street begins, and there the grass grows soft and white, and there the sun burns crimson bright. I think that you see sort of these moods or these images or moments of inspiration that I think must have been drawn from the town here, especially with the magic of it. So you see that directly and indirectly. This is the Key West Writers' Compound at Windsor Village. I love the relationship between Ellison and Hersey in particular. Ellison, of course, best known for his fiction, Invisible Man, which is really about the violence and invisibility of being a black man in um, pre-integration U.S. And John Hersey, who had you know, written about World War II, really put himself on the map with the Pulitzer as a war journalist. When they moved down here, interestingly, they encouraged each other to switch genres. You'd be amazed at how many of these kind of compounds are hidden behind gates. Books and Books is Judy Bloom and her husband George Cooper's bookshop. Uh, they opened in 2014 and have been here since. You know, growing up reading her work, Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing, Tiger Eyes, Super Fudge. My personal favorite, Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret. And we look back on those books and think of them as being relatively innocent in subject matter, at least I know I do. But Ms. Bloom has been both one of the most prolific writers to have ever called Key West home. She's sold, I believe, over 85 million copies of her books worldwide, translated into tons of different languages. She's also one of the most censored. Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret has been censored from a number of US libraries, public schools, and so forth. So she's become an outspoken critic of censorship and has written essays about intellectual freedom. It's a really special place. Casa Antigua is actually the site of Hemingway and his then wife Pauline's first apartment in Key West. Now the two of them were coming from Paris where they had been living as expats. 
He had just published his first novel, The Sun Also Rises, which was met with international critical acclaim and really put him on the map as a young literary superstar. So they rented one of these second balcony rooms, and this is the apartment where he first started writing A Farewell to Arms. They ultimately found the house over on Whitehead Street, which they called home for a number of years after, and where Hemingway wrote some of his most famous novels. Then we have this wonderful new generation of writers, Judy Bloom and Meg Cabot and Annie Dillard and Anne Beattie, women writers that are down here. And I think it's fascinating to have this new period after you know the legacy in the 70s of the guys chasing Hemingway's ghost, Hunter S. Thompson, Tom McGuane. I think it's wonderful that we have this cohort of women writers down here after our history of sort of these masculine writers. That was an awesome trip to the Keys, right? Mm-hmm. Wow, I hope we gave you guys some awesome places to stop on your next trip down. And we'd love to hear what you love about the Keys, so connect with us anytime online at Art Loft SFL. For Art Loft, I'm Lolo Reskin. And I'm Jamani Anamdi. Now remember, art imitates life, so do what? Live a beautiful life. Peace. Art Loft is brought to you by Where there is freedom, there is expression. The Florida Keys and Key West. The Miami-Dade County Tourist Development Council, the Miami-Dade County Department of Cultural Affairs, and the Cultural Affairs Council, the Miami-Dade County Mayor, and the Board of County Commissioners and by the Friends of South Florida PBS.